right are we beginning with a few participants of course only ritu ma'am the one and the only ritu ma'am who always keeps doing the things in her own way and leads uh, aympt by an example how much ever i try to see that we are uh, doing something different always that sometimes we experiment so many things that are different and we uh, forget the fact that that innovation and creativity makes us to deviate away from the routine things what we are daily doing and what we are routinely doing best example is this visceral course learning a visceral course tend to make us feel like we are advanced we are thinking too much of the visceral focus which organ is affected how am i going to treat uh, different structures of the body internal structures but we are forgetting the fact that we are a physical therapist and the patient has come to us with the hope that we'll treat the patient not the organ i don't have to see whether it's a kidney problem liver problem or it's a gallbladder problem i have to see that it's the patient who's having the problem and as a physical therapist the bible or the geeta of physiotherapy is biomechanics if you do not follow biomechanics you are not a physical therapist be it that you got trained in an osteopathic or chiropractic technique you can get trained visceral uh, approach itself from chiropractic or osteopaths but do not forget that as a physical therapist what you are supposed to use is your biomechanics if you do not use that you are not a physical therapist so that is the one which made aympt to improvise the techniques especially the visceral osteopathy chiropractors teach the same as visceral manipulation osteopaths teach as the visceral osteopathy it's like an identity the same uh, thing is followed in cranial course also cranial osteopathy is used by osteopaths whereas craniosacral therapy is used by chiropractors massage therapists in uh, usa they also use this visceral and the cranial as part of the massage itself so visceral manipulation articles are published by massage therapists researchers those are done phd in massage cranial also by massage therapists so remember that multiple professions are overlapping here whenever we are talking about a visceral oriented manual therapy or the cranial oriented manual therapy similarly the thrust manipulation is also used by osteopaths chiropractors naturopathy even ayurvedic massage uh, masseus the massage people in kerala in india they do thrust manipulation after massage so it is something natural that <clears throat> everybody uses that but what is the way that a physical therapist can use it differently is when we apply the principles of biomechanics <clears throat> and as a clinician versus a technician which always we are highlighting in all the courses is your focus on the patient means you are a clinician your focus on what technique i can do how much the technique i can do then that means you are technician because technique centeredness comes i got trained in a technique and i want to use that technique for all the patients then i am an expert technician i got trained in the approach how to approach a patient and then i can handle all types of patients by 
combining various techniques. I am not using only one technique as an expert. I combine all the techniques. I ensure that the patient gets better. So that is patient-centered manual therapy. So remember that our body structures are divided into viscera and somatic. So somatic and visceral structures is the broadest classification. Whereas physical therapist, we are only aware of somatic system, which is the normal musculoskeletal or the neurological or the cardiopulmonary, where the muscles, bones, ligaments, joints, nerves, we are all evaluating and we are treating them with various techniques, electrical exercise, taping, Maybe some of them may be cupping or needling <clears throat> or even instrument-assisted soft tissue mobilizations. But when it comes to what is called as exploring and advancing, why the somatic problem comes? Why do I have my neck to be side bent to the right side? Is it just the muscle problem, joint problem, and the nerve problem? Is it got nothing to do with my trachea? Nothing to do with my esophagus? Nothing to do with my carotid or the jugular veins, carotid artery, subclavian artery, subclavian vein? Nothing? It has only to do with the upper trapezius or levator scapulae or scalenes or sternocleidomastoid? Nothing to do with my visceral structures. How it can be possible? Because human body is having both outside and inside. If the house is what is called as uh, you are having a house, outside the paint is there. Painting of the house. That is the somatic structures. Muscles. Ligaments, joints, bones, nerves, all that, somatic structures. But how the interior of the house is, that is visceral structures. How will you define a house? Not by the outside, by saying that it's a very big house, it's a bungalow, it's beautiful. No. You go inside and you have to see. If inside there is no space means outside so much big it is. Thick layer of uh, bricks and inside is a small room. What is the use? It's not a house, it's only a room. So unless you evaluate what is inside, you cannot identify the house. You can think from outside that I can find the house. But if you want to feel the house, you want to live in that house, you want to understand how the house functions. That means you need to go inside. Because although the muscles are working, although the joints are moving, and the nerves are also conveying the impulses, they all are forgetting that all of them are getting blood circulation. Where from they are getting the blood circulation? Blood is produced where? Blood is pumped by whom? Blood is supplied by whom? All these systems, if you don't treat, how do you expect the muscle to get the blood? Just to putting a needle will increase the blood circulation to the muscle? Never. You have to treat the vascular system. And the same way, a person who is deconditioned and immobilized, having joint stiffness, having edema, having uh, what is called as at, uh, all the systemic effects of intolerance to change in positions and movements and functional activities. So how can you just treat him by treating the outside? If there is a repair in the wall of the house, will it go off by putting the cement outside the house and then painting it again? It will become normal? Or we have to check the wall inside also? for the cracks, water leakage. So unless you treat the inside, remember one thing, outside even if the wall is broken also no problem. 
Inside, there should, there should not be water leakage from the ceiling. So, internal functions are more important than the external functions of somatic or the musculoskeletal system. So, blood circulation is determined like this. Lymphatic drainage is determined by the lymphatic system. Metabolism, energy, digestive system. How that muscles work aerobic or anaerobic? Why my muscles are getting fatigued? Why my right upper trapezius is not getting fatigued? Why the left upper trapezius is getting fatigued? That means what is happening to its metabolism is anaerobic. Why it is anaerobic? Why this is aerobic? I'm not getting fatigued here, but I'm getting tired here. I'm getting pain here. Is it to do with the oxygenation? The pulmonary system? Is it the blood which is not getting the oxygen there because of hemoglobin? Or is it because of what is called as the digestion, which is metabolism or excretion? Because every tissue has its growth, has its nutrition and has its waste products. If the waste products are not eliminated, the tissue suffers. All these are done by the visceral system. Immune system is visceral, which is lymphatic. 80% is lymphatic, the immune system is. And without immune system, there is no tissue, healing, inflammation, everything in response to an injury or infection or malignancy. Always we have this inflammation and healing process. All these are by the immune system. COVID, of course, it's a viral infection. But it can affect the immune system. It can affect the pulmonary it can affect the blood vessels. It can affect peritoneum. That is why patient develops septicemia, multiple organ failure, and the people go for death. <clears throat> Post-operative patients. There is a suture. Hold the suture and cough. Splinting technique and then cough. That's all we have. Or give muscle exercises. That's all. Aren't we bothered about which are the structures that are cut, peritoneal layers, whether there are any adhesions, whether there is any displacement of the organs in the position or in the directions. If I am not looking into all these aspects, how is it justified that I am treating a patient? So that is where the question comes of Patient is having a somatic problem, but you are evaluating the visceral system because past history of visceral disorder was there or you are suspecting that this somatic function depends upon that related visceral structure. Because every somatic activity or function eventually depends on the visceral, either anatomically or physiologically. <clears throat> So, in osteopathy, there are two types of reflexes that are discussed. One is the viscerosomatic reflex, other is the somatovisceral reflex. <clears throat> Problem in the visceral organ, but the effect or the dysfunction comes in the somatic. So, it might be a gastritis, it may be a renal calculi. The patient develops the myofascial trigger point in the low back. So, visceral is primary, somatic is the symptomatic one. So, treating the somatic alone will not relieve the symptom. You have to treat the visceral. Another is the somatovisceral. That is, primary problem is somatic. I have a back pain. Because of back pain, I have an abnormal posture like scoliosis or radiculopathy. Because of that, I have a scoliosis. And because of this, the visceral organs one side are getting into abnormal mechanics and the visceral organs are not able to function properly. So that means from somatic problem, visceral symptoms. Symptom is not in som somatic. Somatic it is there, but it was historical. It was there in the past. But now visceral symptoms are more. So like that, 
the somato visceral and the visceral somatic both perspectives are very very important when we see that in our clinical reasoning the interrelationship between these two domains <clears throat> the outer side of the house versus the outer wall of the house versus the inner wall of the house and then we have the facial compartments which are like the rooms there are walls between the rooms so these are all fascia nerve cells all that which moves from the room to room to one organ to another organ there are structures that are connecting same way it is there in the house so we need to see the bigger picture and ensure that we realize the importance of integrating the visceral to the somatic so that is the reason and as a physical therapist manual therapy is under the physical therapy when it comes to biomechanics so visceral somatic manual therapy so that came into the origin I'm very glad now to have with us dr leomel padrino adriano you can unmute leomel good evening good evening sir and uh, to the ao and pt family good evening yes. everyone i hope you have a great evening ahead of you it's around uh, 7:30 here in the philippines which is around 5 pm in india <laughs> and i hope everyone is yeah. having a great time uh, and i am really pleased to see your background okay because i am used to these backgrounds i i had i i started uh, ignoring the hard copy textbooks okay that uh, we are all with the uh, websites online some pdf okay but uh, these books are always like another family member okay yes sir when we have it with us and i used to carry the books uh, in my boxes around uh, 15 to 20 boxes uh, the pack and that i was taking i was relocating in many places i was changing institutions uh, because nobody could tolerate me for a longer time <laughs> okay so i was shifting from college to college and i was moving from place to place in india and i was carrying all these boxes and finally i realized there's no point in carrying it i donated it to the college library where i was working another book set of books i donated to the pg student the masters mpt student and told him that you give to your junior after you study okay so let them all uh, pass it on and uh, circulate the books make sure that the books are damaged because of learning so and it's just a different domain of life different dimension of life when i was having all those books with me um it makes me feel fulfilled okay like i i am never alone okay i have lot of people with me all that 300 books whichever is uh, i never counted them we never open the books still we feel that attachment with that knowledge it is same like the relationships we never talk to the person but we understand their feelings okay so like that the books will talk to us even when we are at uh isolation we are just uh, sitting in solace and just we just keep looking and then there are books immediately the thought goes to that 10 years back 15 years back i read that book okay so then that journey of that uh, memory is the inspiration the positivity together with the book it recharges you it lifts your spirits some occasionally will also refer to the books in between frequently okay so they might and every time you open the book you are likely to learn more and more from the same book okay so this is another feature of this textbooks that the authors talk to us and they talk to us more and more every time we read that book okay even if it is like in a gap of 3 months you read the book again you will learn more when after 3 years you read the book again again you will learn more so it, it's a never ending process so it's wonderful to see the books behind you and it's pleasure on behalf of the academy of orthopedic and physical therapists to have your presence and i want you to address the participants as the guest of honor 
Uh, you said that participating and learning this VSMT course is a honor for you. But one thing I'll tell you, I'm really uh, feeling like I have one company, one person in the world who non-stop teaches every day. Okay. So if I am teaching, if people may be thinking like Sandil sir is like one non-stop nonsense. Okay. He keeps on forwarding all the topics, flyers, workshops, webinars. Every time Sandil sir is sending something or the other. Okay. But same, I can see that within Leo Mill also, that same divine power is there. We ensure that he will never stop. So his announcement for courses, and his uh, people who are learning also from him, uh, not only in from Philippines, but also from even the Filipinos who are actually settled in the US, plus across the globe. So it's always our pleasure to have such a colleague amongst us who can lead from the front because we need leaders. We don't want followers. Okay. We want leaders to be in the team so that everyone can work for a better world. So God bless him in his all his endeavors. And I am also eager to listen to Dr. Leo Mill. Uh, keep doing your good work and keep inspiring. I'm really very, uh, I, can, I can say that I feel ecstatic okay, when I am um, associated with you. You have done the fellowship courses of the AOMPT. It's always a great uh, blessed experience. Okay. So proceed and share your inputs because you are trained in visceral osteopathy also and you are instructing people on visceral manipulation also. So you are the best person to actually address the audience and of course to also add upon what is VSMT and how did you feel about that so that everyone will try to work together and upgrade their knowledge. Because the today's participants, I kept as a free webinar for interaction uh, to be a doubt clearing session for the participants of the course. Plus, the new people who have missed the course, who have not attended the course, but at least they'll get to know something about this visceral perspective. At the same time, when we have the closing ceremony, they will also have the pleasure of listening to the guest of honor. So, I would first request all the participants to be visible on the screen. Ramit, Neelam, Arunraj, Samuel. Okay, Dr. Dashana. She might be having a low battery in her phone. And uh, participants have to be visible on the screen. Okay. So Dr. Dashana is uh, one who comes first on the screen, obviously. She has to as the general secretary of the AOMPT and also as one of the triple fellowship member together with Ritu ma'am, completed all the courses of AOMPT. Yes, Dashna. Yes, good evening, sir. Good evening, Dr. Yomal. Good evening, everyone. And uh, yes, I think I'm back because the power failure is uh, restored again. So I'm on toes. Yes. So you have become powerful. Powerful yes. idea. Yes. Okay. Right. Sir. Yeah. Eagerly waiting for to hear from Dr. Leo Mill's experiences. Yes, Leo Mill. Proceed. Carry yes. on. Good evening, everyone. Again, it's Leo Mill here from the Philippines. And I like to present to you my learnings in visceral manipulation and visceral osteopathy. And what made the current visceral somatic manual therapy. Uh, different and like with, with this sort of other visceral techniques and methods. To begin with, being a physical therapist is something that I always wanted to do and expanding the, the repertoire and armamentarium and techniques is something that we as physical therapists would like to, to deal on. I know for, for every country, it's called facial therapy in the Philippines and the United States it's called physical therapy. But um, the main focus of the, the practice is the physical physical body and the somatic, right? And 
being a physical therapist and also uh, a teacher and a professor in the university teaching anatomy law laboratory, it's something that um, we tend to look upon, right? And every time we have this anatomy laboratory dissecting cadavers and looking into the models, we as physical therapists would always ask, what is it for us? Right? What do we have to do with the visceral organs? Where we can do this, the hamstring stretching, the strengthening, and the mobilization of the joints. But visceral uh, manual therapy is something that is foreign to us. And for me, it's something that most of my students would tell me, uh, would ask me then, like, sir, why are we studying this? Do, do, do we do something with the heart physically? Can we mobilize the heart so that it will have a better function? Could we, do, uh, could we mobilize the liver so that it will be more um, metabolically active? Those are the questions that I always tend to receive from my students. And then I started studying um, visceral manipulation under the Baral, Baral Institute. And it's something that is really enticing in a way because you were presented in so many aspects of manual therapy on the visceral organs that something that is somewhat correlated with physical therapy, right? It's like um, the main reason for mobilizing this is because of some tightness. And what Professor Santil told us before, it's about the mobility and motility of the organs, okay? So with this kind of thinking, we tend to focus on the visceral organs as something that we could actually move mobilize, manipulate, and using the hands, okay? And the main premise why it is something that we should do is based on trauma, okay? That's the premise of the Baral group, wherein we have this different trauma from macro trauma to micro trauma for everyday trauma, just bump on the head, bump on the ribs, for example, would have a ripple effect on the fascia and into the organ. And it's something that we would want to release. Of, as the name, as the word imply, release, it is always something that is controversial, especially now for those who are into evidence-based practice, right? And, and the premise of this visceral manipulation is that we want to improve the mobility and motility, particularly the organ itself, the fascia and its surrounding structure, okay? And, and in a way, uh, when you are going to study visceral manipulation on visceral osteopathy, they would lead you to the listening techniques using your active hand and your conduit hand. Okay. The listening hand is something that you place upon, like we call it global listening. You, look, uh, you place it on top of the patient's head and you would try to feel the pull of the fascia or the direction of um, pull. For example, it, for example, I have a problem or I have some tightness on my chest when a, when a visceral osteopath or a visceral manipulator would place their hand on top of your head, it would tend to pull towards the heart, okay, or towards the chest. And then when you use your conduit hand like this, okay, the conduit hand would tend to lessen the tightness or the pull. So in a way, that would be your philosophical philosophical um, assessment, okay? So um, for example, we have a tightness, for example, on the chest, I put my hand here, and I could feel as if my hand is pulling towards my chest, okay? And then when I put my conduit hand, on top of my chest, for example, okay, then there'll be less pull, there'll be less tension created. Okay, it's much like imagining that there's some form of tension that is being pulled. And then when you put your hand on the affected side, you try to lessen the pull, lessen the pull, okay? So for example, I, I put my hand here, and it leads me towards as if it, I feeling the tightness on the liver side. And I put my conduit hand on the liver. 
then there should be less tension. And because of that, because of that, uh, because of that assessment, you would now move your liver or try to mobilize the liver. Okay. With that premise, um, it's a good actually initially in in the world of rehabilitation and treatment, it would be a good thing, right? Because um, it's something that is something that you can offer to your clients and patients. I've seen a lot of these patients where in the um, they would have some knee tightness, for example, knee pains that is not relieved by the usual stretching, patellar mobilization, joint mob, uh, so, sort of myofascial release. And then upon doing your listening techniques, okay, you might feel that it's the part of the kidney that is tight. Okay? And then by sense of your logical mind, you would tend to mobilize, you would tend to connect okay, the knee tightness because of the kidney area of, um, of connections. It could be somewhat because of the kidney irritating the L2, L3 area, which is somewhat referred pain on the kidney, okay? Or sometimes other osteopaths would tend to correlate it with emotions. Okay, this is some of the, how would I say, more of the enigmatic, more of the energetic, or some, sometimes we could choose the word controversial on the practice of uh, visceral manipulation. For example, you have fears, fears, which is somewhat correlated with kidney. And because of that fear, created on the kidney, it would then cause pain on the areas that is somewhat correlated with the kidney, like, like, your, like your knee, okay? Or if you have some anger issues, okay, or you get easily peeved or easily pissed in the, in the, in the Western world, okay, you might have some problems with your liver. So if you have some anger issues, uh, many osteopaths would tend to mobilize the liver as well, okay? So, uh, for example, you have a tendency for depression or being easily uh, having the feel, feeling of grief, grief, sadness, then but they will always tell you that it's correlated with the lungs. So when you do your assessments, it's practically something that is both philosophical and somewhat um, spiritual, energetic. Okay, now um, doing this is something that is, is somewhat demands a lot also of your philosophical mind, okay? And being a physical therapist, it's the challenge of having this notion also of your emotions, of the other's emotions that would be uh, taken into consideration, okay? But being a physical therapist myself, you know that sometimes, um, although, knowledge of the emotions, knowledge of the correlations of the emotions with the visceral organs are important. But being a physical therapist, okay, we know that for a fact that it should always have some biomechanical reasoning, right? And with the biomechanical reasoning, there's always a sort of biomech biomechanical assessment and then a biomechanical treatment and management. I hope everyone would agree with me that uh, with the osteopathic principles guiding you with the visceral technique, correlating it with the viscerosomatic techniques we've learned from Professor Sentil makes our, our level of management and treatment to another level. What do I mean, okay? It would really be hard for me to assess someone that is really the big, fat, Sorry for the word. <laughs> but I myself is a big guy, right? And many, many students of mine, when we're doing visceral manipulation, find it hard okay, to mobilize my kidney because of my big tummy, <laughs> because of my big abdomen, okay? So the thing is, it's easy to do the visceral manipulation or visceral osteopathy techniques 
okay, clinical wise, I mean, uh, clinical reasoning wise, because you know for a fact that, for example, emotions and those other manifestations and symptoms could be addressed by visceral manipulations. But the challenge is, how can we do it? If I go to the liver, then I mobilize it using mobility and motility, it would be an easy thing, knowledge-wise, right? I just have to follow the mobility or the motility of the liver, and then you'll be better. But the thing is, not all bodies are created equal. Okay? So, for example, if I want to immobilize uh, the liver of a bigger size guy, it would really be challenging for me to go deep compared to someone who's more of a uh, thinner, right? It would be hard for me to mobilize the kidney, for example, of a, of a wrestler or a weightlifter compared to someone that is a sprinter because they are thinner. And it's easier to follow those organs if you're doing it with, with much uh, slimmer guys. But with the knowledge, the biggest um, take that I got from the visceral, so, uh, visceral somatic techniques, manual therapy uh, trainings that I got from the AOMPT is that there are other structures that you could use to influence those organs. Like for example, kidney, kidney, right? In, in, in visceral osteopathy, you have to go to the kidney, push it up and just follow the motility. We call it the, if there's a presence of kidney ptosis, when the kidney is a little bit down and hard below, it might cause some pain on the inguinal knees and some, sometimes the thigh. Now, leech wise, all I have to do is to lift the kidney up, okay, and then improve, uh, and the, the symptoms already better, okay? But with the visceral somatic trainings that I got with the AOMPT and from Professor Seltil, it gives me now a better idea on how I could use the, for example, the hamstrings, the contratus lumborum, okay? The psoas major, in order for me to mobilize the kidney without actually touching much the kidney. For example, on people that would have some tendencies to be deeply layered, okay? So I still got a good results. I still got good result, okay? By just doing a good assessment, finding the somatic dysfunction, the primary somatic dysfunction, but the clinical part is more improved because I was able to correlate the somatic part, okay, the spine, for example, the psoas major, okay, the, the inhibitions of the other muscles in order for me to mobilize the kidney. Okay, again, the good, the good correlation, the good relationships between visceral osteopathy and the visceral somatic techniques improved significantly my clinical practice. I could treat anyone de depend, uh, regardless of the body type. Okay? I can even treat female patients. Right? For example, uh, I don't know with, with, with the other parts of the world, for India, but in the Philippines, it's hard for me to treat patients' chest, especially for female, right? So if there's a problem, for example, for the lungs or even for the heart, okay? I have no other options but to, to refer them to another practitioner who's also a female, for example. But because of the training I got from the viscerosomatic system, I was able to treat patients by just mainly looking at the trachea, okay, at the breathing, and then correlating it with the other structures that may be moving as I move my limbs, as I move my chest up, as I move my spine, as I move my neck. So with the, with, with the visceral somatic, 
okay? I find a good harmonious relationships between osteopathy, principle-oriented treatment, and the viscerosomatic manual therapy, biomechanical base, and um, biomechanical base um, assessment and management. So the intake is quite, uh, quite simple. Okay, although visceral manipulation in the point and perspective of those who are not yet tuned or trained into the system, uh, they may find this system a bit more uh, controversial and many people would find it skeptic. But as we try to improve on the visceral osteopathy and combine it with the visceral somatic system of Dr. Sentil uh, Kumar and the whole AOMPT. And as we have more people like uh, Mam Ritu and Mam Darshana here, who's always uh, trying to improve the system. I'm sure eventually, even if this is a controversial technique, eventually a good uh, evidence would be able to sprout from this kind of training. Same thing, is, uh, same thing with the cranio manual and the cranio um, osteopath, uh, cranio, uh, how do you call it, the chrome, osteo manual. Osteo manual, therapy, yeah. yeah. Cranio osteo manual system. It's somewhat enigmatic, but as a practitioner of osteopathy, combining cranio osteo, osteo manual and uh, the other cranio neuro manual techniques, Together with the visceral, I was I would be able to come up with a more holistic practice rather than just doing joint mobilizations on the site of pain, combining the trainings with the uh, with all what we got here from the AOMPT would make us a more credible and a more holistic practitioner. And with that, I really like to uh, I, I send my appreciation and my gratitude to AOMPT, to Professor Sentil to Mam Ritu, to Mam Rashana, and all the rest of the AOMP. Being a Filipino, I hope I will be able to invite you when the time when the uh, when the time comes after all these pandemics. <laughs> and with that, thank you very much. I always believe when people tell that uh, uh, when I used to give conference lectures, I used to give invited lectures as a speaker. And they tell, I tell, I ask the organizers, give me the slot in the end of the session. I don't want to take the time of others. Okay, so I'll talk in the end of the scientific session. But uh, the organizers say, no, sir, we want everybody to listen to you. So please start the session. When you are in the opening session, maximum crowd will be there at the conference. So everybody will listen to you. Uh, at the end of the scientific session, the students will be getting ready for the fashion show, dance, all the competitions. So they'll be getting dressed up. And you know, girls take a longer time to dress dressed up. And uh, physio is full of girls in India also, same as Philippines. So, and uh, they used to tell that, please don't take in the evening. Then I tell them, it's not that the best people take where the crowd is there. When the best people take, the crowd will be there. They will come. And you should not go where the crowd is. The crowd should come wherever you are. So I really experienced that when I am listening to Leo Mill here. It's fantastic that he has done this doctor of osteopathy. You know, he, he's done the training in all levels. He's got the visceral from the Barrel Institute itself. So it's definitely is doing a great work clinically and also sharing his inputs and experiences, wealth of knowledge with all his fellow colleagues. So his inputs and he was spot on. I will say that it was bullseye. So he was like every shot which we took, it's hitting the same bullet area. Okay. So even if the bullseye is like this, first it was here. Second, it is in the same hit. Okay. So that much uh, it was a, on target. I really appreciate his inputs, which clearly shows that he has used it on patients. He has seen the missing gap. 
and he was actually from uh, inside he was envisioning like i should integrate the mechanics and he would have seen some thing partially incompletely here and there but when he got it as the visceromatic manual therapy that has made him like a fulfillment like wow yes okay this is my destiny okay so i have actually come away uh, at a one position where i can do my best for my patients because when he had this experience of attending a cadaver session anatomy itself as a physical therapist itself he has like as a physical therapist there are those organs needed for me okay that he changed it into what i can do for those organs okay so that made him to develop his skills uh, it's really every uh, uh, information what we heard from him is definitely a jewel of information and inspiration for everybody and uh, i hope uh, i to eyes of the aompt dr darshan and dr ritu will also agree with that yes uh, over to first darshan yes good evening sir uh, good evening dr leomel uh, good evening your two ma'am and all the participants here today i uh, truly truly agree with uh, dr leomel and his inputs were so wonderful uh, for me uh, this course was like joining the dots because uh, i am a physical therapist i am a reiki therapist so for me there was always an inquisitiveness i had heard about uh, osteopathy uh, not that in details but okay i knew uh, there is something to do with the organs and of course in reiki also we work with energies uh, where we deal with um, uh, relaxing the organs or relaxing the structures and there and that is how we get the uh, benefits of it you know the pain is relieved or the functions are improved but it was always like we should have some biomechanical uh, basis for it and that is what i picked up from visceromatic uh, manual therapy because uh, i was totally unaware okay uh, there, there can be there are ligaments of course there are muscles of course but how they are correlated and how these ligaments would affect the mobility and motility of the structures was uh, totally something new for me and uh, that made my understanding much better when i learned from uh, uh, sir that uh, on on various uh, organs you know we we have learned all the systems from you and uh, we can now correlate this that uh, how the ligaments of the organs or the muscles surrounding it definitely have an effect the visceral organ will have an effect on the um, somatic structures and uh, vice versa and the various techniques of course they are totally new to us uh, in all the aspects but it it has given us that basis where we can incorporate these techniques and we can uh, take our treatments to a second level Uh, as physiotherapists we will always as dr leomel was uh, mentioning that uh, we will treat the structures only at that particular localized area we will never think beyond that okay what next you know what is that missing thing uh, which is still uh, you know what we say which is still giving a um, a treatment sessions will not be complete without doing that because sometimes we do experience this uh maybe i would like to give an example of frozen shoulder or any restricted mobility of the shoulder where we do everything and then we still feel okay this is this is not it you know why why i'm not able to get that complete range and that why will lead us to thinking okay why not address the visceral organs you know that way so i connect everything because i practice reiki definitely with all my patients <clears throat> and i see the results there but i wanted something strong you know to support this and i've got that so if i practice visceromatic therapy now if i practice physical therapy visceromatic therapy and of course uh, my reiki therapy it it gives me that edge okay i'm doing the complete holistic treatment of a patient so i'm not going to stop anywhere it's going to be a holistic approach and my patient is going to be better so that is how i have taken this course up you know and i'm really happy that um, i i really got what i wanted so all these years because reiki is all all totally philosophical totally energies and even um, like dr leomel was explaining that osteopathy also uh, like we now have started getting that uh, evidences but otherwise it's like totally philosophical 
But then when we have an evidence like this with visceral-somatic uh, approach, uh, it gives us, uh, uh, we can put it down on paper saying that, yes, this is how we worked and this is the result of it. Something which we see or we can feel and we can treat gives us, uh, I think, uh, uh, upper hand for the treatment. So I'm really happy that I had joined this course and I learned and I, I really joined all the dots now and uh, my treatment approaches are going to be holistic for the patient now, totally, completely, with proper understanding of all the mechanics. Because uh, in AOMPT, uh, what I have learned since two and a half years is like totally mechanical. Everything has to be, there has to be some basis, some biomechanical basis to uh, the assessment also and to the treatment also. And that works for me because if I can see, if I can assess, then I can treat better. So, so that way, a visceral-somatic uh, manual therapy course has been a blessing in disguise, I suppose, for me, of course. And uh, I will practice it and I will definitely come down with uh, uh, case presentations also now for that including all the other therapies, what I'll be doing on the patients. So thank you so much, sir, for this wonderful course. And uh, over to you, sir. Ritu, ma'am. Words for Leo Mill and... Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, once again, thank you, because uh, we will, our thank you is in a very in a sequence way. It will come definitely with every session because we are getting so much... Uh, upgraded upgraded courses from your side and today the dr leonel has already explained in a too much clarification of how the osteopathy and the visceral after attending this visceral course sir is if sir is getting so much new concept for treating his patient it means that uh, how much you have made this topic very easy for us that we are not going to learn the osteopathy there, but during the Vistro session, you have explained each and everything. Either it was the osteopathy, I was either it was the somatic dysfunction or the visceral dysfunction. So I, I want to say that uh, for me, this course is just like the MRI, that magnetic resonance, uh, resonance, because we are going inside the Vistra. So uh, previously, we were just showing the outside wall of the house. Is it the MRI or it is the ultrasound? <laughs> ultrasound is when we will enter the home then we will use the ultrasound but from outside i will use this word the mri because now i am seeing the outside wall of my house of that body after seeing that i will go inside and then i will see that the plaster of that inside wall is correct or not either the ligaments are in a correct form or not then i will go towards the ultrasound to see that how the visceral organs are talking with each other either they are in a function or they are in a dysfunction so according to this or can we say that outside it is magnetic you get yes. attracted by seeing exactly. the outer side okay you get yes. magnetic yes whereas sir. when you actually go to the inside you will know the noise or the sound <laughs> yes. yes sir okay so, so after after knocking the peritoneum the cavity and the walls of that particular body shell then we are entering in the visceral organ and then how we keep our hand on that particular organ and feel their rhythm, their voice, their cry, that how they are in a suffering, either they are stretched, either they are tight. So how we can feel this is all is explained by sir in this visceral course because uh, previously we are treating somatic, somatic, somatic. But now, yes, we can say that we have uh, so many options there where we can after the somatic rule out, we can treat the visceral also, or we can start from inside that we can treat the visceral and then we can get the best result in somatic dysfunction also. So this force is, I think it's a vice versa. We have a double route for there. The U-turn is also available in this route. Either you can go from somatic or in a visceral, so you can treat the patient. Because I think the, uh, now our uh, thrust is fulfill about that we are not standing outside the building, we are inside also. We can even treat the flow of the blood by treating the vascular system, the blood vessels, and also the, if there is a uh, speed breaker like lymph node and the channel of the lymph channel, we can treat them also by giving them a, a lateral to medial, that connecting them on a right pathway. So this is all, in this course, this is a, in a very depth because if we start from the... Uh, uh, breathing is the main source of your human life. So we have started our course from the 
uh, lungs, the respiratory dysfunction, where we started with the how we correct the trachea, then esophagus, then we move towards the lungs, where we have seen that how we can release pressure, then we can go inside the lobes, how we can release that probe, how we can use the induction, we can release the fascia, we can give the vibration uh, on particular. After that, we uh, went in a very deep, there is the heart, how we can treat the heart with their uh, surrounding ligament, the phrenic ligament and the posterior vertebral ligament or the sterno superior and inferior ligament by treating, by keeping our hand on diaphragm, then we can treat, then we move entering in the gastri uh, gastrial cavity where we have so much variety of ligaments and the myofascial structure are also how we can, like Sir was explaining, how we can uh, check with the psoas major uh, by keeping hand on the psoas major and we can restrict the flexion of uh, our hip flexion restriction and in a posterior side, how we can treat the quadratus lumborum with the uh, hiking of the hip, we can check. And if uh, after treating the gastric, the peritoneum fluid, how we can check it, the fluid, either the velocity is hypo or hyper, we can check the lesser momentum, greater momentum, and then we can go towards the ascending, descending uh, colon and the sigmoid colon also. And the very beautiful structure that is the screen in the side that a uh, little bit slowly uh, that is the sleeping there so how we can affect that spleen working with the breathing and with the kidney in the posterior part by keeping our hand on the kidneys how we can connect with the spleen and the kidney uh, simultaneously then moving towards the male reproductive organ where the muscle uh, uh, placement plays a very major role either the rectus abdominis ex external internal oblique that plays a major role then the female reproductive organs, how the myofascial part takes place. And also there are also so many ligaments, which we were previously not aware of that, that uh, in a female repro reproductive system, we can treat the ligament also. We just thinking that we can treat the myofascial. But after that, is this course, this is clear that we can treat the ligament also in a female reproductive organ. And then uh, moving towards the, in our session, where we, yes, sir. Because you are talking about the female reproductive system, I wanted to show this, the oh. female reproductive system, which actually we got it yesterday. Okay. okay. So, and you can see the pelvic floor, some amount of information. You can see the posterior side ovary with the ligaments. Okay. The broad ligament. Yes. So there are uh, things which are improving, okay, for uh, the tomorrow's kinesiological taping on the uh, women's health perspective for the reproductive system also and uh, the visceral kinesiological taping, uh, which is an advancement from the visceral manual techniques into using an IASTM or cupping or kinesiological taping. Uh, so these are things that are also mechanically influencing the viscera. So we are going to utilize that and also for cosmetic purpose, okay, how kinesiotaping can help in cellulitis or it can be for uh, post-operative abdominal conditions and obesity or even during pregnancy, you don't want the stretch marks okay, after the childbirth. So you can use the kinesiological taping. Uh, so there are a lot of things which is of the craze for the future demand for healthcare. And we always teach futuristically. Okay, we don't teach the past. And uh, thanks to all your inputs and inspiration, so we keep developing and improvising all these courses. So, yes, Ritma, continue. Yes, sir. So I think this course was uh, completely. Uh, I will say from that top to toe, everything is covered according to either the vascular, the lymphatic system, arteries, veins. We have treated. Uh, we have blood vessels, all the blood vessels, we reach there, all the visceral organs, either they are through the peritoneal cavity, their walls, means we have uh, uh, we have taken a tour of all the body, inside the body by the visceral manipulation uh, therapy. So it's a, I think it's a very, uh, again, it's a very wonderful course, I will say for me. I have really enjoyed all the session because every session has the, uh, its own beauty because in every session you have added something new either with the uh, the on the model how you have made the perfect that handmade model you made or on a living model you have shown 
a different type of movement how the upper limb activity and also the lower limb activity influence the working of visceral organ that is also a very i think new thing for all of us and in in this visceral treatment you have added all the neural component also by treating the vagus nerve from starting to last session you have shown that how we can treat the vagus nerve also because which is the longest nerve which are cranial nerve which is coming and it affecting all the organs so it's i think a very important uh, for all of the physiotherapists to learn about this uh, course because after that they will be more confident to treating their patient either the patient is coming for the somatic dysfunction but this real knowledge is mandatory for everyone so thank you so much sir for a nice course and uh, thank you dr ryamal sir for your best uh, input which have shown us a great view of that yes we can also treat so many thing and we can learn from you also and thank you ma'am darshna ma'am as my classmate and we really enjoyed and we are blessed with the best academy ampt and with the best guide dr sir yes sir absolutely yes, sir. yes sir. now our moment to honor a genuine uh, sincerity and passion as also as a token of love and appreciation it is the opportunity that aompt will now present leo mel with the global physio leader award so congratulations it is a pleasure and see that uh, it's all about teamwork and it's all about learning from each other which is learning forever and working together which will be the success so may god bless him with more and more energy to lead and inspire many more billions and uh, billions in the future okay so good luck to leomel so now uh, we need leomel, to sir. yes leomel sir okay yes leomel sorry yes yeah. sir uh, i would just like to to extend my gratitude and thanks thank you and um uh, to to the whole AOMPT for having us here and extending your your country to us the philippines at the same time i really appreciate the learnings that i got from you and also give me more of the extent of how can i help further i'm always am um uh, inspired especially with one of the posters there with einstein saying that never stop learning because you never stop teaching and with that sir i turn over to you thank you very much thank you thank you okay so good luck uh, keep inspiring i would now announce for the participants to come on the screen to ask questions so do not miss this opportunity because uh, participants ask the questions directly on the screen is mentioned in the certificate uh, requirements in the webinar uh, flyer itself and aompt we always want uh, that face to face interactions we have received some questions in the whatsapp group and uh, let's see if this participants anybody is coming on the screen final call for the participants to come on the screen now live uh, people must ask your questions in english and if you are not joining on the screen now you know what professor santil does he removes you out of the webinar okay so who is going to be removed first dr amit wagela not coming on the screen so first time removing dr amit wagela done next is dr ankana who is also not coming on the screen to ask any questions so remove our samuel from rwanda he is also not coming on the screen i i used to think that he is a little bit uh, sincere guy he is not uh, texted me here on the chat also arun raj is always there for the free webinars he comes on screen when it is not needed but he never asks any questions any time but he asks for certificate without fail okay 
So, not Ruddi. Neelam, uh, you are also not coming on the screen. Am I audible or not? Removing one by one and everyone is just silent. Okay. Good. Audible, sir. Yeah, yeah. audible. Okay. So, I'm removing Dr. Neelam. And then I'm going to lock the meeting by some option here, which is possible, not possible. Yeah. Okay. So they can't enter the meeting now. Right. So uh, we, can we see the questions in the WhatsApp group? Is Are you able to read it out? Ritu ma'am? Our free webinar group. And uh, most of the participants were curious about knowing the difference between the visceral osteopathy, visceral manipulation, and the visceral manual therapy, which was, of course, aptly addressed by Leo Mill. And uh, in one more factor, what he actually was shown as the demonstration that uh, global listening and then uh, doing the pressure on the viscera is actually the viscerocranial. Okay. We saw the craniovisceral in the CROMT. And uh, what he mentioned was the viscerocranial. So that means we are actually giving the pressure on the viscera and we are seeing the change on the cranium, especially the uh, falx uh, cerebri, okay, the midline. And if you're keeping more towards the posterior side like this, okay, then you can feel that from tentorium cerebelli. So it's something which is a unique one, but in a CROMT perspective, you can also see that like without pressure on the viscera, with the pressure on the viscera, tuning fork, auscultate. Tuning fork, auscultate. If it is pal cerebri, here tuning fork, here auscultate, anterior posterior. Okay. You will find that resonance improves or resonance reduces after you give the pressure on the viscera, next again tuning fork and auscultate. So that changes the property there of how the cranial mechanics changes in response to the visceral pressure. So definitely this is something which is uh, one of the points that could be added to the viscerocranial dysfunctions and uh, assessing that. Of course, we have that for falx cerebri, it's not the tuning fork alone. This is for the cranium. If I'm keeping like this, it is the frontal, parietal to occipital, okay, the bony one. But if it is the percussion hammer, then it is the falx cerebri, membranous conduction. Bone conduction versus the membrane conduction, a difference between the tuning fork versus the percussion hammer. Okay, so... Definitely, that is something which he brought it up, and we could be able to link it now with cranial dysfunctions. Uh, right? Yes. Yes, sir. Sir, here is uh, three question. Uh, first question is when will we perform? You or can ask your question first, ma'am, Ritu, ma'am. You can ask your question. Leo Mill also can contribute. Yes, sir. It's a post operative sir, question. Yeah. Yes, sir. Sir, today I have seen uh, one patient. She is. Uh, around 60 years old uh, last uh, six years uh, six months back uh, she operated for the removal of gallbladder and some part of jejunum and uh, she is uh, she is having a severe covid in last year and having she is asthmatic also but after the surgery still she is having a pain in uh, all around her umbilicus area and she feels stretch in her stomach every time and her appetite is after the surgery her appetite is very low she can't take so much food at a time. She eats very less food. And uh, her breathing pattern, because of COVID or uh, her breathing pattern, she, she is not able to take uh, proper inhalation and exhalation. Both she feels she has to manage when she wants to breathe, like slowly, slowly breathing, not so fast. Or she cannot walk. Uh, she cannot take high walk. She uh, walks very slowly. And uh, the one thing is very major problem. She is having a constipation from last six months. Either she is taking the medicine also, but it is not uh, ruling out. And uh, she passed stool uh, once in a two days. 
and after that she feel uh, uh, passing the stool she feel pain in a stomach area not in a rectum area so this is the her uh, presentation of her uh, profile that how she is dealing with this surgery so when uh, today i met to her i just saw that the area of her stomach i have seen that there is a because uh, that sutures the, that nothing problem with the sutures now everything is heal out everything is fine but uh, i have seen that there is a tightness all around her umbilicus area so i just uh, i was trying to uh, rule out that uh, uh, either these are the because of that particular any ligaments which are related to the liver uh, with the umbilicus that are creating a tightness or they are stretched so i have just uh, as a uh, that i have given the quick release on that uh, omentum area so she was feeling very uh, light that uh, what you did she said i just take the all the uh, stomach in my hand and release like you have shown us and in all the direction and i approximate the fascia towards the umbilicus so that time she was feeling little uh, better that she was saying i am feeling better but uh, to today the first session so i had i not uh, i didn't do anything so i was uh, i want to uh, know from you that how i start my treatment for this type of patient yes sir Yes, Leomil. Think if she could list the problem list. Uh, one is the constipation, and then during the bowels, it is the stomach area pain. Okay. So another uh, the post-operative with uh, the other shins around the umbilicus, and another is the breathlessness on exertion. If she does any kind of walking and uh, reduced exercise tolerance. Okay. So another. Uh, any other rhythm what are the other problem list but these are the main symptoms and sometimes she feel the pain in thorax area also so that uh, i have not tested so much now i have just focusing on that particular uh, visceral organ the, uh, all around her stomach area i have seen the problem because she was complaining majorly about that symptoms only and where is the scar exactly located it uh, it is uh, there are very major cuts one cut is near about the liver and other cut and uh, all that up above the umbilicus area that was the cut because the, the doctor said that there were some uh, the stones were uh, stick with that her uh, stomach wall also so there were so many uh, in gallbladder was full of stones and as, as well as the in the stomach area that was also stuck all the stones so they have removed some part of that area also and the jejunum was it was in not in a good condition there also there were infection because it her symptoms start with her uh, gastroenteritis and the vomiting so these are the symptoms at from 6 months uh, before she started with these symptoms when she went to the uh, gastroenterologist they find by all the reports that the case is not in a good condition so they have to operate immediately otherwise uh, it will uh, hurt worse and all the organs also in the stomach so this was her uh, case history and covid uh, she suffered with a very in a severe condition of covid she was hospitalized for a one month in a covid time after that she is also asthmatic also so this is the symptom yes sir yes liam yes um have you tested the hepato the ordinal ligament area because of the liver scar you said that if it, there's a bigger possibility that because of the scar you may also affect the hepato the ordinal ligament mm -hmm. so sometimes it tends to go towards the it could be sense like a tenderness on the floating ribs on the right side okay um you could also check because if it's really tight it would tend to put more pressure towards the right side pulling on the other visceral organs up because of the uh, connections of the other um, fascia organ another thing that i would like to ask would be if there's any chance that you've tested the uh, mesenteric tree or the mesenteric uh, roots because sometimes it, if if it's really tight Okay, in the umbilical area, it's really sited there. If it's really tight, then it would be one big pull towards the side of the rib of the liver side, thus causing one 
tightness. If that happens, some, sometimes the mobility, the motility of the large intestines are also compromised. I guess uh, that, that's why maybe uh, she also has some possibility of some, um, some difficulty of passing, uh, passing out uh, stools. Okay, so uh, one, one recommendation when you did the, the lift on the umbilicus, she also have to, if this is the umbilicus, if this is the umbilicus, you may also want to mobilize and see if there's some tightness that is not part of just lifting it up. Because sometimes if the root's really tight, that root is also connected with the, I think it's part of the vertebrae, L2 or L3, right? So when it's really tight, it makes the, it tends to also push and pull on the, on the vertebrae, that's causing some parts of, some feeling of heaviness of the abdominal area, uh, mimicking as if it's more of colicky feeling, but actually it's just a, just an irritation possibly on the surrounding tissues. So I would suggest uh, you may want to look into those and then uh, see if there's anything that you can do about it. Um, also, more often than not, if the hepato, hep hepato duodenal ligament is tight, there's also a possibility for the spleno duodenal ligament to be tight as well because of the connections of the transverse, uh, transverse uh, part of the duodenum. So it tends to make it somewhat is pulling together. That's why it makes all the entire system very tight, thus preventing the movement of the stool going down. Okay, so I, I, I would tend to look on those and then just um, see if if uh, if you could release all those ligaments. And a very ancient technique <laughs> I would tend to use would be the the uh, the the I love you massage. If you're familiar with it, you may want to look into it. But I don't do it yet if I haven't tested the, the ligaments because it would cause more cramping of the of the stools on the end part. So I would suggest you just look on the ligament. Also, um, yeah, that's that's basically what I would do because most of what you would tend but most of what I've heard from you is more of the affectation of the from the latter part from the uh, from the latter part of the small intestine going to the large intestine going out. So that would be my one of the intakes. And uh, I would like to talk about the visceral osteopathy side because I think I I know more about it. But I I, I also believe using the visceral somatic technique. As if you're using the flossing, I would like to call it flossing. You're flossing the 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 parts of your external obliques, as if you're trying to move it to have, to have the contractions. I guess would also aid with the with the the movement of the bowel. I, I'm I'm pretty sure uh, Doctor Senti would know more about it more than I can do, more than I do. So I turn over to, to Professor Santil, other things that you may want to look into and other things that you may want to try on your patient. Yeah, I would uh, try to explore more in that other two, other than what we have addressed till now. I will ask her like whether the constipation is dependent upon uh, any kind of particular diet, okay? So to modify a dietary advice or whether she has tried what all interventions, what all treatments she has taken and what were the responses. And um, if, for example, ligaments, I would, before diagnosing into a local assessment, I would prefer whether side lying is any relieving kind of symptoms, any particular side, left side or the right side, whether it is supine or it is head end elevated versus lower layer limbs bent. Okay. So all these positions, then I will diagnose that there is some structure which is above, which is getting relaxed to show she is feeling better if head and elevation is relieving the symptoms. Or then I think about uh, right side, uh, for example, she is relieving with the left side lying. That means I think of a left structure with the spleen or with the stomach. Okay? So the transverse colon with the uh, stomach. 
because although the pain is felt at the stomach region, it can be from even from the lungs or it can be from even the uh, two structures, stomach and the spleen. And definitely large intestine is involved because of the constipation. Uh, but when the effort is done, there is also abdominal contraction, external internal obliques. And of course, the spleen area, the external and the internal obliques are also having the facial attachments. So maybe because of the effort and uh, if it is because of referred pain from the intestines, it will not be a mechanical one. Like while contracting and making the effort, the symptom is not more. It is like any time the pain will be there. Okay, the stomach area pain. Uh, so this is during the effort. So it shows that there is a muscle contraction or intra-abdominal pressure change, which actually makes that uh, some uh, the uh, inflamed structures to get irritated mechanically, okay? kinetically. So a change of position with again a Valsalva maneuver, uh, uh, then about the movements. For example, um, I am keeping my finger on the umbilicus and then I'll rotate the upper trunk, rotate the lower trunk, um, ask the subject to lift one arm, lift one leg. Okay, so various active, passive, in different dimensions to see that somatic interactions. Um, a gross lifting or releasing is fine. And uh, even a visceral technique, vascular, or you are trying for lymphatic, it depends upon the history of people who are having varicose veins in women. Then you can think of addressing the vascular, then going to the visceral, okay? And the next one, you are uh, having people like uh, cellulitis or people who are deconditioned because of the surgery and bedridden and uh, um, you are expecting the lymphatic fluids to be more, okay? So definitely addressing the lymphatic system will be better um, as a beginning. Then moving on to the local visceral options and uh, mechanically diagnosing by the change of positions. Okay, so something like that. So on kinetics and kinematics. So incorporate, there's nothing new what I told. It's all the principles which I have already discussed in all these master classes of PSMT. Uh, what's important here is to treat the patient in the quadruped position if necessary, because the uh, it is the relief position. Okay, so when you are actually having the umbilicus released from the great Roman term or great Roman term relief position itself. And in the quadruped position, then involve the other treatment techniques, uh, whether you want an upper trunk rotation or lower trunk rotation, all that in the quadruped position. Okay, so that will be better um, to think of. Yes. Uh, sir, uh, uh, as you were saying that head elevation, yes, she keeps her uh, head in an elevated position because uh, when I, I lied down her, uh, there was a one pillow, but she asked that I want one more pillow that will give me a relief so that my head will be elevated. So that uh, point which you were saying that that position relieves her. And uh, when she lie down, uh, she uh, fold her both uh, the lower limbs, then she feel comfortable in that position. She was saying me, when I fold my both the limbs, I feel comfortable in this position. And uh, when I was checking, I have checked with the rotation of the lower limb. And when uh, I have kept my hand, the fingers on the umbilicus, I rotate on the, the left side. She was feeling comfortable in left side rotation, but in the right side rotation, she was feeling pain. So this was the finding which should today I noticed in her. That help, head elevation relieving both the lower limbs uh, folding is that position is giving her relief and the rotation to the left side of lower limb was giving her some relief. Yes, sir. Okay. Anyway, um, point is what is our thinking? Okay, so where is the thinking actually moves on as a continuity? from what we listen from the patient and then what we examine. Uh, without the examination finding, there's no point in telling that I just did one treatment, okay? I did one technique and because it is first day, no, no, you have to be specific. You have to inform clearly that whatever that was done as assessments and uh, see that whether it is umbilicus fixed and then upper trunk rotation was influencing our umbilicus fixed and lower legs, uh, the rotation was influencing. 
the lower leg rotation was done in uh, flexion or lower leg rotation was done in the extended lower limbs and then the rotation uh, from pelvis because flexion and rotation means you are eliminating the psoas major because you have flexed the lower limbs means and the external internal obliques predominantly but if you are keeping the legs extended and then you are rotating that means you can involve the psoas major so it is dependent upon the medial structures whether you are suspecting the kidney or your duodenum or uh, the pancreas all that um, so it depends on also the history of maybe a diabetic not then definitely no need otherwise maybe um, pulmonary why i am telling is in any visceral disorder treating the breathing pattern is very important without the diaphragm being released you can't expect the intra abdominal pressure to be uh, regularized or optimized pelvic floor and diaphragm so uh, the transverse myofascial releases so as part of the visceral or generally as osteopathy also and also as we see in terms of uh, the compound wall okay for the house that is actually the compartment which is actually formed by the diaphragm and the pelvic floor so when a patient has a respiratory dysfunction uh, diagnosed respiratory disorder and then having breathless on exertions my focus will go to the respiratory so and i will think of more how to make a relief of symptoms in the palmo manual therapy perspective or the pulmonary visceral uh, visceral somatic perspective what are the relief positions how can we actually influence which lung was most affected when she had the covid whether it is the lower or the upper uh, if it was obstructive means does she have the typical pattern of hypertrophy or uh, uh, short end diaphragm okay if it is restrictive means whether she has a uh, chest wall mobility myofascial restrictions so all that which ever we learned in many of these courses so ultimately the thinking process answers is always there when we are looking at the problem oriented perspective patient is having a dyspnea on exertion whether we should treat or abdomen has to be treated first uh, first thing is breathing also brings the pain but it does not mean that inhalation and exhalation both are equally affecting the patient if it is equally affecting the patient suspect the pleura so then pleura with the connections the ligaments which are attached to the diaphragm so you have that uh, phrenic uh, what is called as this all this is phrenic splenophrenic the hepatophrenic uh, all this uh, you know renal to the phrenic all these structures are attached to the diaphragm or surface uh, gastrophrenic uh, so all the esophagophrenic is also there okay so and these are the ones which are actually getting relaxed when you are elevating the head end of the subject so that means is it like a lengthened diaphragm the diaphragm is going up uh, restrictive pulmonary condition so it's not coming down the ligaments are already taut so the patient is half lying or uh, is anywhere restrictive condition it helps the breathing also in the half lying so that reduces the ligament tension and uh, the patient feels better abdominal symptoms okay so but when it comes to the lower limb uh, flexion you can suspect that it's not the diaphragm that is coming to the organs it's the organ that is going closer to the diaphragm when legs are bent so various perspectives to think but uh, my goal will be to restore restore the uh, vital functions like breathing or cardiac vascular or lymphatic then go for, for uh, sometimes it's good to for see a short term relief something the patient becomes better they will come the next day so directly you do the relief techniques and definitely it will help it's not wrong but when you do that kind of things your thinking process gets bypassed uh, you are not following the structure of the organized reasoning what is instructed in the course then after that you will find that you are somewhere and you don't know where to begin from because you have not followed what was actually instructed so that's the reason that uh, 
obviously. So when you are going systematically, definitely you know that first you have to treat the pulmonary, next you come to uh, from diaphragm to the ligaments, after that you come to the structures here. Okay. Um, yes, relief is important, but with that relief, in that position, for example, the quadruped position, then what it is, how that is different, or pulmonary, how it is different. Are you going to, uh, what is called as mobilize the ribs in the quadruped position, um, release the intercostal muscles in the quadruped position, or you are going to see for the uh, sternum, all that, okay? So, I seriously feel that if somebody at, uh, who has done all the courses uh, adopts a shortcut and then after that uh, loses the way and then we feel like what to do, it's not, it's not a reality, okay? It's just a hide and seek which we are playing with ourselves, okay? That uh, we just have to look behind and we know that we had the answer in our back, okay? Uh, which is important and we forgot. So that's the simplest way I can put as an example. And always when patients are there, there are millions of probabilities. You can't get a, a solution to the patient unless you do the in-depth evaluation. So without doing an evaluation in all the domains, um, at least, for example, a neural, myofascial, or an articular, so in what way it has actually proximally and distally, whether the ribcage any force on the ribcage relieved the symptoms or aggravated the symptoms, uh, whether it is about to do with the, um, the thoracic sympathetic chain because pain was more, so sympathetic system will be overactivated. So whether that is anywhere influenced, thoracic spine treatments can it help or uh, the scar scar tenderness. You are telling that the scar is apparently normal. I don't believe that. Okay? If it is outright, I don't believe that. Okay? Because if you are actually evaluating the scar with a functional uh, challenge, uh, mobility of the scar with the rotations of the trunk, mobility of the scar with the coughing action, mobility of the scar with the breathing, you hold the scar and then you do that uh, diaphragm or hold the scar and then do the coughing sneezing. There will be a restriction definitely. You can't tell that the, because it is multiple tissues including peritoneal discard. So, we cannot think that it is totally normal. If scar is normal, why will the uh, momentum other shells will come? Okay. So, it's not. So, these are things which has to be kept in mind and see how we can uh, be more clear and focused in the strategy. Yes, sir. Darshana, your question? And directly interact with Leo. Yeah. I think um, I put it down to you, sir, on WhatsApp, but I think uh, two uh, major concerns uh, where I look out for um, uh, visceral techniques is commonly seen uh, with uh, what patients we see in our one is um, many patients with uh, low back pain uh, they complain of increased pain uh, when they have uh, a lot of gases or flutters right i mean uh, in fact uh, for me also uh, after i've undergone a hysterectomy and <clears throat> uh, i observed that i do have back pains, of course, due to my uh, weakness of my core muscles, uh, pelvic floor also. But then I get this increased pain when my abdomen is bloated uh, and I have a lot of gases. I can definitely uh, rule out myself, you know, okay, the pain is definitely due. Because once I pass motions, then the pain totally comes down. You know, I'm like much, much relieved after that. So, and uh, this is what other patients also have seen, you know, where I keep on asking uh, patients like, okay, what are your symptoms? When do you feel that? You know, sometimes they do come up with this, that, uh, or maybe they don't realize this also at times. So what should be our approach in that uh, case? You know, if we think of visceral somatic 
और ऑस्टोपैथिक रिलेटेड यस लियोमिल I, I would like to ask again the assessments, okay, uh, on how how is it becoming worse or being better? Because uh, mainly given the the gas and the bloatedness might not be uh, complete or or somewhat gives me an idea of what I should do. Because Having the bloatedness might mean that there's some issue again, possibly of of, of um, digestion rather than rather than just uh, um, uh, visceral orientations na, of cases. Like, um, uh, are you having this bloatedness every time you eat a certain kind of food, or do you have a certain certain issues with with uh, with some some hard to digest, like for example, meat, corn, um, nuts. Okay, so uh, given given those first would have me establish what kind of diet that would produce those kind of areas of pain because having the bloatedness and having the gas would sometimes cause more of a, not really, pain but more of a discomfort because uh, the visceral organs said, uh, according to most studies doesn't have much of a pain receptors right so that would give you more of an easiness and then according to even to most of our studies okay that would be more of a different reflex it could be more of a visceral somatic reflex right that's why you have those back pains so again uh, I just want to find out first which causes what then then it would be a loop like visceral somatic or somatic visceral and if you just want as as professor sentil had mentioned if you just want uh, uh, a quick fix or a relief of the symptoms you could either start with visceral manipulation or even somatic manipulation of the spine because definitely just mobilizing the part of the spine would have that kind of symptoms pertaining on the somato visceral loop or visceral somatic loop okay but on my part, I would like to have a better grasp of what to have caused that that problem to begin with. Okay, so that would be my intake. And, and you can use your visceral manipulation or visceral somatic techniques in order for you to release those tensions as uh, perfectly explained in all the different modules and courses that we ran. But again, uh, again, I, I need a uh, further assessments on what could be happening on the patient. Because sometimes uh, just changing the diet or having more more fluids uh, would help you with the with, uh, bloatedness. And uh, there's even, there are even studies that shows that just improving your fibers or just having a, having a sunlight, right? Mm -hmm. Having the, the morning uh, or morning or afternoon sun would actually improve your vitamin D, which also affects your 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 digestions. Although these are some of the may not be somewhat correlated with with physical therapy or physiotherapy or even with with, uh, with osteopathy, uh, adding an knowledge on the required nutrients like your probiotics or prebiotics might help you more, also in the long run. And that's right. that's my take on it. Yes. Uh, because, yeah. In uh, addition to the diet, um, a kind of maybe a change of climate or maybe change in water, mm. anything that is the electrolyte. Okay, I'll try to explore more. And uh, also, like for example, uh, the change of positions, of course, is mechanical, okay, lower limb movements. Yeah. All these patients who have this gas uh, bloating, if they don't have any food, what happens? When mm. Totally there is fasting means. Versus the common and the uncommon food, the preferred food versus the... Mostly I suspect it is the preferred food which is causing this effect. Okay? 
So yeah. it's something that is a favorite food which you are actually taking, which you not noticed or not related to it. It's unfortunate that the food which you actually like the most is actually creating this. But still, at least we will know it like for assessment purpose. We are not going to tell you to stop that having that. But at least yeah. we can relate it and see what can be the effect. So I would like to add on to this. Uh, I love eating rice. Okay. I was in Bangalore for the last 24 days and I could see the difference. Like, you know, eating rice there was not causing any problems. I was much better there. But same here when I'm back home and I'm eating the normal rice, whatever is available here, what we normally eat, that has already started creating problems. I can strikingly make out that difference. So the maybe the quality of the grain or whatever was available there was more comfortable for my system than what I've been eating here for so many years. I, I uh, rarely had back pain and rarely had um, gaseous problems there, you know, in Bangalore. But here again, I'm again back to that, uh, like, you know, that with that pain and with that bloating and all those things, which I didn't have in Bangalore. There was very, very minimal bloating. So as you mentioned rightly, that even that uh, factor really matters a lot. There are a lot of things which is not in our uh, focus. Like maybe the soda bicarb in the rice, okay? Uh, just add it as an added flavor to make it more uh, like even for the basmati rice, Easily usually cooked. they do that so that it becomes more fluffy, more softer and yes. feathery like that. So the rice is not actually, it is the grain which is from the crops, okay? The rice shaped they are made in the factories, okay? So that is what is uh, some things we have to understand uh, the dynamics of food, okay? But the real one, which is from the grains, you will feel better, okay? Even a normal rice compared to a basmati rice, the yes. basmati rice is the costlier rice, which is supposed to be the high quality rice, okay, which you might have been having in Mumbai. Yes. But here, yeah, the normal Sona Masuri rice or the Karnataka local rice, you would have still felt but comfortable because Absolutely. it is natural. Absolutely. Possible. Okay. The, the next thing comes to physical activity. If you are in Mumbai at your home, how much will you recreationally go outside walking, more mobility, okay, physiologically, generally, versus here when you are there for your master's exams, there is no moment for rest. Okay, so and uh, it is hostile to the exam center in the exam center up and down. Okay, right and left everywhere calling one person getting signature from another. Okay, whether they have called me, whether my chance is there or not. So a lot of things. There is a lot of physical activity there. Okay, right. mentally also, I am not uh, equating it to stress. Okay, stress will, will it relieve the symptoms of gastritis never. Okay. So it's not matching, but the physical activity can actually help in the reducing the bloating. Okay? That is also another. All of us will feel that uh, when there is a congestion, there is like pressure, okay, tightness like that. Sometimes we just press it, we feel better. Yes. Do some intermittent compression, bumping my yes. cup, or the gas will be released through the rectum. Yes. Either of this it depends upon the proximal or the distal part of the GA tract, okay, where the gas is actually. Or sometimes the gas can be in the peritoneal cavity also, okay, or the retroperitoneal. So it can be anywhere, okay. So this is something which is metabolically created and the nutritional experiences should be explored more. Even the nuts also and all that, okay, whether there's any kind of uh, a favoritism which is there in uh, tongue, we feel happy with the taste, but internally the organs are allergic to that. Right. So there also it will be a problem there. Okay, we enjoy the taste, but the organs are not happy. They are overloaded in some uh, manner. So it might happen. So not all require a, a VSMT evaluation. So some things we have to see for what way and post-operative. Your history also tells about uh, post-operative uh, hysterectomy. So you should yes. think of how it was before that and how it is after. Okay? Mm. 
was there any kind of a distinguishable observable difference if at all uh, but you should uh, if it's a patient when you are asking such a question you should be very very careful not to mislead the patient into you are not having the gastric trouble before the surgery after that the surgery you have started so you are blaming the surgeon okay so that perspective should not go it is only the body's adaptability to surgery body's recoverability to the surgery that focus we have to talk and uh, of course about this also saturday i am planning to take a webinar on the linguist linguistics and semantics what language and how to actually use in an orthopedic physical therapy perspective i am going to take as a separate uh, webinar interactive plus a little bit of uh, uh, what is called a deliberation so we all should be aware of uh, this multi dimensional aspects okay as you being and uh, your own experience is different definitely from what others are having one thing i'll tell you having a peptic ulcer a delayed uh, food habit routinely having very spicy food and uh, that is more of it's gastric which is from the stomach okay but otherwise if you see it is not related to the food and that gastric problem eventually comes to two hours within two hours after food okay that particularly is related to that food if it is independent of the food it is the timing of the food okay so that way the sympathetic power activity versus uh, parasympathetic because right. parasympathetic creates that more secretion Reduces the secretion in the sympathetic power activity. So that could happen with the mental stress also. Sometimes during the exam, we don't feel hungry. Uh, we don't take and all those things. But your situation is not in that picture. It is away yes. from. Yes. So all this we have to see for what are the likely good indicators of this versus this. Get on with whether uh, any kind of uh, Uh, what is called as a pelvic pain. Okay, any symptoms together with the pelvic. So then I can suspect that it is retro or it is the infra peritoneal, sub peritoneal, you know, okay, so versus yes. intra peritoneal cases. Yes, yes. mm. So pelvic pain, yes, of course, is there. So also uh, there was one more aspect to this, like. Uh, because of a total hysterectomy, like as we are talking about viscerosomatic and the ligaments and the muscles, so is there a possibility, like because the structures are removed, you know, and there's that gap created there, wherein the intestines have to fill in that gap, or like I'm not sure uh, what it is going to be inside, but uh, as per my thinking, uh, the ligaments definitely will be affected inside. because there is a gap right there were structures which are removed and uh, so to to fill up those gaps there uh, the other organs will try to maybe sag down uh, is that going to create uh, is that going to affect the mobility and motility of the intestines um, mainly the intestines yeah because the, or the bladder also for that matter bladder is still okay but i think more of the intestines uh, one important fact what we did see that uh, the small intestine especially the ileum uh, it has the adaptability to you know, go beyond uh, even around 50 times its length like the space you know you can stretch it like beyond beyond any number of length okay so the loss of volume because of the uterus removal hardly will be like 200 to 300 ml okay space this is bladder most of here is this is the space of course when it is filled with uh, you know when that baby that pregnancy those things and all it enlarges and the other organs are adapting okay so that means the uterus becomes bigger other organs are becoming smaller during that but when it is removed the surgeon only can be clear like uh, where the reattachments are done okay what are the facial reattachments which were done okay so either way it's not the volume problem okay don't think that the extra space that is got filled with the gas okay it's not that much physical as we expect okay this is more physiological so 
the extra space will be taken over by the other organs within the three weeks yes. and they will be absolutely normal okay so adaptability of uh, the organs depends upon the level of physical activity and uh, i i i if i have to make a guess this problem would have been there before surgery also but not this much troublesome yes it might have been there but not this much troublesome so this uh, a kind of the surgery would have got what is called as uh, precipitating it more like a frequent more troublesome like that yes okay yes and after that the diet type is actually the uh, causative okay so the causative with the precipitative aggravating could be uh, what is called as posture okay what sustained posture what we are actually adopting the somatic yes. components okay all the other things and uh, contributing can be hormonal which influences the metabolism okay okay so it could be that but it's a minor effect because post hysterectomy and the hormonal imbalances and all that but you can definitely make it up and we know the solutions that it is right from various aspects how you can address okay all right sir right yes. first of all take the structural perspective out of your mind i'll tell you mm. say ultrasound mri whatever that is done we see all these anatomical models okay after that if somebody does a pneumonectomy to me okay i feel like right side lung not there right lung is the major lung 80 percentage of gas exchange is right lung okay right lung is removed. okay whether the heart will come towards the right side okay i am feeling the heart beat towards my right side okay and uh, my diaphragm is elevated in the right side so <laughs> Uh, does it going to affect the, the liver going mm -hmm. upwards more okay uh, so is it like intestines are to but the right side so i should never lie down on my left side lying i should be on my right side lying okay because it, this is the lung which is expanding and uh, these all things only makes that ribs to get crowded to develop all these myofascial restrictions in the uh volume uh, reduction surgeries okay like pneumonectomy and finally like because of the outer myofascial articular dysfunctions of the ribs and the chest wall i eventually develop visceral problems in the combination and yes. it becomes a very complex picture rather the right. alternative yes yes it is removed it was harmful it was removed now the harmful one not there so it will adapt other structures will adapt what i need to ensure is i maintain a healthy lifestyle and mm -hmm. uh, get on with whatever mobility and the other uh, prophylactic methods which i can do and uh, after which beyond that anything happens maybe an evaluation and intervention may be needed okay just to see but even if it is fully fibrosed uh, it is still functional other side expansion and the gas exchange may be sufficient enough because we are not utilizing all the areas of the lung for the gas exchange okay the same like our brain uh, so even with one lung we can still be perfectly normal with a graded exercise testing prescription and all that physiologically is there all if there are symptoms with uh, liver definitely i can treat the right side diaphragm to come down okay so that is something which has to be manually done through the chest wall because lungs are not there to expand and push the diaphragm so and i can influence that visceral organs to pull the diaphragm down I have the positions to keep the diaphragm lower like half lying it's like a restrictive condition post operatively it becomes like a restrictive condition okay so right try to see how uh, uh, because uh, one thing is our perception actually makes a big difference in our responses of the body yes when the exam is there your concentration on your own body would have been minus 
right okay. so that concentration also would have uh, that they have a diversion or whatever would have also made you feel like a gastric problem is not a big problem there that exam the viva problem is the practical problem is there. maybe <laughs> so maybe. <laughs> maybe with the rice or maybe it is a combination maybe. of biopsychosocial okay so everything right. is there Yes, and uh, make sure to get the structural perspective. I am talking about the psychological domain because you raised the point of structural. Yes, that removed and then after that and all that. Okay, otherwise there is no psychological domain. And if that psychological domain comes, then any problem maintains as chronic. Yes, because of the memory of the experience, the body also digests abnormally, metabolizes abnormally. And every time the gas is part of our life, yes. something like that. Okay, so there also there is central mechanism. Okay, right. So uh, try to see the solutions and get the functions to overtake the dysfunctions. Okay. Yes, sir. Right. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Doctor Liam. Yes. All right. So we are ready to close the session. Great, ma'am. Yes. Sir. Writing down? No, sir, I am not writing. No, writing down. That's what we're doing, looking down. Something like That's this. It. Drawing. Ah, that is what writing and drawing. That is after seeing only we'll know that whether it is a, a, it's a legible means it is writing, not legible <laughs> means it is drawing. <laughs> <laughs> Our handwriting only it will become like a diagram. <laughs> so, anyway, it is the pen and paper. For example, sometimes it is not legible; it becomes a signature. Okay, <laughs> legible means it is just writing your name. Hmm? So, right? Yes, Leomel. So we can sign off. And yes, sir. Right. Good luck to you. Thank you so much. Bye and bye. Best wishes to the Soma Fells, the academy, the institute under which Dr. Leomel is providing the courses. So, uh, and our collaboration to take the next step forward uh, for a better future. Right. So, good luck. See you. Thank bye -bye. you, sir. From the enjoy the evening and uh, ASMT specialists. Okay, <laughs> right. Uh, yes. uh, sir. Uh, I also want to take the sports. I'll, I'll talk to you privately. Uh, I also want to take the sports. Uh, the sports. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, okay. I was then thinking. The about the tomorrow's course, the kinesiological taping, okay, that abdomen also, uh, definitely you should explore the options of what I am going to share. Uh, see that how it can be organ specific kinesio taping, okay, how we can influence that. Uh, it's anyway a small course in front of the fellowship, uh, the two fellowships which you have done, and you're doing the third now with the sports, okay. Tomorrow is just a part of the process. He will tell. Ah, that is Dr. Sandil, I know. That I am definitely going to attend. Okay? We don't have to tell it separately. Okay? But fellowship is important. <laughs> okay? Right? So, so, good luck. And we'll meet again tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.